In the current year of the video game industry, it's pretty hard to go into a game without knowing at least something about it. It's not very often I can look at a couple screenshots for a game and be impressed or interested because years of hype and subsequent letdowns have conditioned me to feel skeptical and jaded towards pretty much everything I see nowadays. I feel like the less I know about a game before playing it, the better. I feel more excited and enthusiastic about playing it because my expectations are almost non-existent. Owlboy is one of the few rare cases this year in which I knew next to nothing about the game before playing it. I learned about it through a donkey video of all things, and what I got from his video was that Owlboy was a 2D puzzle platformer with really pretty pixel graphics. I haven't ever really been a big fan of most 2D pixel art games that have been released in the recent years, as they were either massively underwhelming or just not entertaining or fun to play. But I decided to give this game a chance, mostly because it was available on GOG, and most of the games that I've bought on GOG, I've ended up thoroughly enjoying. So that begs the question, what is Owlboy? Well, to put it simply, imagine if Metroid and Zelda had a baby. That's Owlboy. When I figured that out, I was ecstatic because those are my two favorite Nintendo franchises. Heck, this game may not be made by Nintendo, but it sure feels like it was because those Metroid and Zelda influences are really apparent at times. In Owlboy, you play as Otis, an anthropomorphic owl who is coincidentally also born a mute. Obviously, this is similar to how Link or Samus doesn't speak, to help the protagonist act as a catalyst for the player's actions, rather than just being a simple character quirk. Regardless of whether the silence may just be a means to the end for the narrative, Otis does still communicate by the use of facial and body gestures, so he isn't just a blank slate. Being an Owlboy, I think it's pretty obvious that you're going to be flying around a lot. It's the first thing you learn to do, and it's also the first objective you're given in this game. Fly around and explore your environment. And it feels pretty liberating to just start wandering, flying around these areas, and collecting things. Now that I think about it, I am so glad I didn't have to spend a good portion of the beginning of this game just jumping around learning how to fly, or waiting to unlock the ability to fly, because I would have hated that. I wouldn't say that this game is open world by any margin, but it is definitely open to exploration during certain sections. The game is split into a bunch of large areas which are interconnected to one another, but are slowly unlocked through linear progression. Every time you complete an area, you usually unlock some pathway that leads you back to the beginning of it, so you aren't locked out of it. You can just revisit these zones at any time in order to find all the hidden coins located within them. Though the only reason you'd really want to do this is to collect all of the owl coins and to unlock all of the upgrades in the buccaneer shop. Now, one of the coolest things about Owlboy is the way that it handles combat. Otis himself has no way of directly attacking and damaging enemies, and can only temporarily stun them by using a spinning move. In order to damage enemies, Otis needs to pick up one of his allies. Depending on which one you are currently carrying, you have a different kind of attack. Otis can also throw objects and bombs to damage or stun enemies, but you're mostly going to be shooting everything with your allies. I don't think I've ever played a game that has used party members to both solve puzzles and also function as the only form of attacking enemies. It just makes the game feel really unique in comparison to all the other 2D games I've played in recent years, or really ever. Now, Otis's allies aren't just tools for him to use. They also serve as his friends, and are the primary voice behind the game's narrative. In total, you gain three party members over the course of the game, the first third of which is spent with Getty, who pretty much just has a gun to shoot enemies. He pretty much talks for Otis the entire game, acting almost as a mediator for Otis and the player. The second party member you unlock is Alphonse, after you defeat him in a boss battle. Alphonse has a shotgun, which can also function as a short-range flamethrower which you use to burn specific objects and enemies, and in turn, create a small amount of light for the player. The first thing that you learn is that fire opens up a lot of pathways for you to burn, and therefore, access to a ton of areas that you previously couldn't get into. The final party member that you unlock is Twig who also happens to be an antagonist up until he is subsequently betrayed by his own allies. Twig has the ability to shoot web, tying up opponents for a short duration, as well as the ability to fire rope, which can latch onto walls or chains, and then be quickly pulled towards said wall or chain. The second ability, similar to Alphonse, allows you to access areas that were previously inaccessible during the first portion of the game. I also didn't figure this out until the last hour of my playthrough, but you gain iframes when you're being pulled from one location to another while using Twig. Now, you don't have to carry all three of these guys with you everywhere you go. Right after you finish the first dungeon, you get the ability to teleport your allies directly on top of you or right into your arms. Basically, this functions as a way for you to quickly switch weapons, as well, simply aiming the right control stick after you unlock this teleportation ability allows you to summon the ally you currently have selected right into your hands if you aren't currently holding anyone. Oh, and dropping your allies long distance doesn't kill them. So you've got Otis, Getty, Alphonse, and Twig a ragtag group of misfits who start out as enemies and end up as friends by the end of the game. 
Speaking of which, the story of this game starts out with the simple prospect of Otis trying to keep his village safe from pirates, only to have a troublemaker get involved and subsequently spiral out of control into a grand tale where Otis and Palace have to end up saving the world from destruction. It's cute, simple, predictable, but still enjoyable regardless. The characters have a nice charm to them, and the pixelated world that D-Pad Studios have created here really is beautiful. And while this world may have a sense of naivety to it, there is a darker underlying plot with twists and sinister intent to be discovered. Right away, the game makes it apparent that this world was lost or even broken by something. As the game progresses, you learn that the owls, who are now few in number, were once a near omnipotent race of beings whom populated the entire planet and capable of technological feats that have slowly been lost over the span of an unknown number of centuries. The legacy they left now shows only in the ruins of their cities, the ancient relics they left behind, and an ever-dwindling population close to what seems to be extinction. To some, this game's lore might come off as ham-fisted or only included for the sake of necessity, but I love this stuff. The game leaves the concept of the loop completely open to interpretation rather than giving it a concrete definition. Whether it relates to the heat death of the universe, or the universe itself running on some sort of metaphysical loop is never directly stated, and I really appreciate that kind of writing. The only real issue I had with this game was the controls. Not that they were bad, I just personally found them a bit, say, stressful to use. I was playing the game on a PS3 controller, and in order to attack enemies during the first half of the game, you essentially have to spam the right trigger button. It wasn't so bad at first, but there are some sections and boss fights in this game that made my index finger hurt from having to spam it constantly to attack with Getty. Maybe it would have been different if I had played this game with PC controls, but I couldn't even get my mouse to work with the game, so I was just stuck using a controller the whole time. Going in blind was probably the best thing I could have done with this game, because I enjoyed it way more than I expected to. In fact, I would go so far as to say that this is one of the better, and probably one of my personal favorite games to come out this year. It's a solid release. It has great gameplay, an amazing soundtrack, fun characters, an exciting story, a beautifully designed world, and interesting lore that is somewhat left up to the player's interpretation by the end of it all. I commend you, D-Pad Studios, not for just making a great game, but for the simple fact that you made a modern 2D platformer that managed to impress me this much.